good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our honors lecture series on global engagement. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. And we have with us Dr. John Bile, who is our Dean, presiding over this august event. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker today, uh, Dr. John Dubois. Um, one of the main reasons why I invited him to speak today was because I so much enjoy chairing the uh, honors theses that he directs. Uh, he's doing a lot of really, really interesting work, and I, I hope that some of you already are working with him. Um, Dr. Dubois is a professor in the Department of Biology. He is a member of our honors faculty and has been for many years. Uh, he earned his PhD in botany from Miami University of Ohio, and he conducted postdoctoral research at, in biochemistry at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. At MTSU, he teaches a wide range of courses, including General Biology I and Honors General Biology I, Plant Physiology, uh, Biostatistics, and um, occasionally portions of wine appreciation. Uh, so really, really interesting stuff. Uh, he also manages the Department of Biology's greenhouse, and that's where a lot of the, the projects come from. He's working specifically on plant tissue culture, which he tells me is analogous to stem cell research in humans only with plants. Um, he is a great teacher, he is a great mentor to our students, and I'm sure that he'll have many interesting things to share with you today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dubois. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. I'm glad I was invited to, to speak with you. Um, I've actually got some of my lab members here today. Uh, and we're going to, toward the end, we'll highlight a little bit of some of the work that they are, what they're working on. Um, so my talk today is on uh, traditional Chinese medicine with herbal medicine meets Western biotechnology, but I'm going to speak on herbal medicine kind of in general. Okay. Uh, medicine, for those of you that are pre-med, I'm, I'm guessing a few of you may be pre-med students out there. Uh, medicine has kind of come full circle in the past 4,000 years. Started out uh, in 2000 BC, basically it was all herbal medicine. You don't feel good? Here, eat this root. Uh, we went from doing that to things like, uh, well, that root's not very good, so say this prayer, uh, drink this potion, swallow this pill, take this antibiotic, and where are we today? We're back to, uh, well, uh, that stuff doesn't work. Here, eat this root. <laughs> so we, we've, we've gone full circle. Uh, so I want to talk today about herbal medicine and also talk about how it's met with Western biotechnology and then eventually get to some of the stuff we're doing uh, in here. So, I want to give you, I'll start out with a little bit of background about uh, traditional herbal medicine um, as a pathway to modern medicine today. Uh, looking at especially the 19th and 20th centuries where a lot of that transition has been made from herbal medicine to the pharmaceutical idea of medicine. Talk a little bit about herbal medicine today. Uh, talk about the, and then the traditional Chinese medicine. And, and from there, we will transition to the, the biotechnology uh, part of the talk which biotechnology is a very large umbrella, uh, which covers a lot of aspects. What we're going to talk about specifically today is active components in plants. So we, we know that certain herbs will be useful to cure certain ailments, certain diseases, and so forth, is what are the active components in the plants, how do the plants get them, and then how do we get them. Um, talk a little bit about uh, drug discovery, uh, which referred to as bioassay-driven fractionation, kind of a big mouthful term. Uh, we will tell you kind of what, what goes on there. And um, Dr. Phillips has graciously allowed me to, to uh, kind of, you know, talk to our strengths, tell you a little bit about the Tennessee Center for Botanical Medicine Research here at MTSU, and if hopefully there'll be time, talk a little bit specifically about what some of the students are doing in my lab uh, and some of the research that has been done and what, they are, what they're doing today. All right. So uh, talk about herbal medicine a little bit. Uh, when you think of herbal medicine, or you mention herbal medicine to some people, the first thing that comes into your mind is say, oh, that's a bunch of aging hippies up in the mountains, and they're just you know, chewing on leaves and, and twigs and that sort of thing, uh, which is probably true to some degree. Um, but herbal medicine is much more than that. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not just a fad. It's been going on for literally thousands of years. Uh, if we look at today, um, 
again, it's a few statistics. 75% um, of the world population depends on herbal medicine. Uh, and that's a phenomenal number. 75% uh, of the world population depends on herbal medicine. In the United States, what people, what people don't realize is if you, if you look at all the prescribed drugs in this country, and we are a very heavily prescribed drug country, 10% uh, of all prescribed drugs have their main primary component is a plant compound. 10% of all the drugs that are prescribed in this country are directly from a, a plant compound. Uh, and if we, don't, if we look at just 25% you know, of our common medicines, have um, some of their compounds are derived from, from plants. And if we include fungal products, that means half of all of our prescribed medicines have some tie to plants or fungi. So herbal medicine does have a very, very strong base in our um, medical, uh, medical field. Uh, and what is interesting is, you know, when people think about you know, pharmaceutical companies coming up with, with drugs and so forth, a lot of that discover discovery is by trial and error. In other words, not with their, they're not in there trying to fabricate compounds. They're in there trying to discover new compounds. And a lot of that comes from herbal medicine, which we'll get to a little bit later on in the, in the talk. So i just get through a little bit about herbal medicine. Uh, nobody really knows when, when or where plants started to be used as a, uh, a, a, a topic for medicine. Um, the accidental discovery was probably uh, early humans at one time found a new plant. They started chewing the plant and they said, well, this tastes pretty good. I think I'll use this as a, as a good food source. Uh, and then they realized that, uh, well, you know, my head was hurting. I ate this food source and all of a sudden that ache in my head went away. So that probably was the foundation for the beginning of herbal medicine. It's just that, that discovery of, you know, a good tasting food that just happened to do something for them. Um, the earliest evidence of actual medicinal plant use is goes back 60,000 years in a Neanderthal man's grave where they did a pollen analysis. They looked at the pollen because pollen actually will survive for a long time if it's preserved properly. And looking at some of that pollen analysis, they found that all the plants that had been buried with that corpse all had medicinal properties to them. So that tells us that even early Neanderthals knew something about plants and how plants could be used as a, a, a medicinal source for uh, some form of ailment. Um, the earliest actual record of herbal medicine dates back to a 4,000 year Sumerian clay tablet that recorded numerous plant species and, and how they could be used as remedies for various um, ailments. Um, Dioscoritis in the first century uh, AD uh, put together a, a, a text that he referred to as Demetria uh, Medica, which was descriptions of plants, how they are to be used, and what remedies they are for. Uh, the interesting thing was this was a standard medical reference for over 1,500 years. So if you were studying medicine back uh, uh, over 500 years ago, uh, you probably were introduced to this particular uh, uh, publication. Um, Hippocrates in the uh, uh, early uh, 400 BC, uh, Hippocrates is referred to as the father of, of current medicine. Uh, he also identified over 300 plants that were effective medicinal plants and reported on those. Uh, and one of the quotes I have on here uh, comes directly from him, uh, you know, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. Uh, he was a very strong proponent in eating the, the correct foods would help with um, taking care of uh, ailments or even preventing ailments. So little was added up until the Renaissance. Uh, Paracelsus in, in, um, in you know, the early 1500s uh, put together a, a, um, a manuscript today is referred to as a doctrine of signatures. And this was kind of interesting because he basically stated that God provides signs in plants as to their proper use. So in other words, his idea was that God designed the plants to help us to understand how do we use that plant. For example, uh, plants with red sap, he said, those are used to treat blood disorders. Uh, plants uh, like such are things like the walnut, if you look at the walnut picture in the center there, it kind of looks like a human brain, is that that would be used for brain disorders. Um, and then another plant called hepatica, or the liverwort, looks like the lobes of the human liver, and he said, oh, this must be used for liver ailments. Um, there's some truth in some of this, and what is interesting, a lot of this is, is you know, yeah, some of this can be thought of as nonsense, some of it's not true. Um, I wouldn't go out and start, you know, eating the uh, red sap of various trees and so forth, unless you know what you're doing. Um, but what is interesting is that uh, many of these herbal remedies actually have a basis in science. It's not just, you know, some mountain person coming up with some idea. There's actually a, a, 
a scientific basis for, for some of these, um, some of these uh, plant materials. Um, and again, some have become useful prescription drugs. As I said, 10% of all the drugs prescribed in this country have their main component as a, as a uh, drive from plants. William Withering was the first to actually scientifically begin to investigate these folk remedies back in the 1700s. Uh, he was the first to actually sit down and say, let's see if there is actually some scientific evidence in these herbal um, remedies. And again, this, is, uh, this was in the 1700s, and remember herbal medicine has been going on for a few thousand years before that. So he figured something had to be, had to be going on there. Um, he's the first one that to actually take and look at these from a scientific standpoint. Uh, and he actually set the standard for the pharmaceutical chemistry industry. And he looked at uh, a com uh, the plant um, foxglove, which is used, was, was, well back in those days was treated for, uh, we used to treat dropsy, which today we, for, we know of as congestive heart failure. Um, the compound you see to the, to the right of the plant there is actually a compound called digitalis, which is the same name as the plant. Um, and that compound, if you're familiar with digitalis, is actually used, is still used today as a remedy for arrhythmia. So an individual that might have an irregular heartbeat um, can use certain uh, levels of digitalis to help smooth out the heart rate. Uh, 19th and 20th century saw kind of a transition. Uh, up until that time, it was a lot of herbal medicine. Everything was, okay, take this herb, eat this root, that sort of thing. Uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, the shift was where scientists were beginning to try to purify active compounds that we find in these plants. Try to find out what is the active compounds that are actually causing uh, or, or getting rid of the disease or, or healing the ailment. Uh, the breakthrough in the pharmaceutical area came um, in the early um, 1800s when uh, Frederick uh, Sir Turner uh, actually isolated morphine from the opium poppy and morphine is still used today. Uh, it's still a, a, very, a very potent pain reliever um, that is used today. Uh, because of the scientific breakthrough where, where we started looking at the actual compounds, um, the, the direct use of the plant extracts began to diminish. Um, less, less of, you know, drink this tea or eat this root, and more of us looking at the actual chemical compounds of, of, these, uh, of these plants. So what's herbal medicine like today? Uh, today, as I said, uh, up to 90% of the rural population in developing countries rely solely on herbal medicine. Uh, and they do not have a family doctor. They don't have clinics. Basically, is they're looking at herbs. Uh, in many of these countries, the herb, the medicinal herbs, are sold right alongside all the other vegetables at the village markets. Uh, and you can see uh, you know, a lady sitting there, and in each of those little containers is just different herbs that are dried, ground up. And if you have certain ailments, you just get a certain herb. Go home, make a tea, and drink the tea to take care of that ailment. Uh, practitioners of herbal medicine, it's not just kind of you know, miss, hit and miss, um, but they do undergo extensive training to look at, you know, what plants to use for what ailments, how to prepare the plant, and, you know, how to actually do the application of the, uh, of the, me of the medicines. Looking at traditional Chinese medicine, this is what's really interesting because traditional Chinese medicine um, still, in, even though they have a modern healthcare system in China, they still use traditional Chinese medicine, which is the herbal medicine. Uh, as, it, as it has in my second uh, bullet point here, it's actually a blend of herbal medicine, acupuncture, and uh, Western medicine, pharmaceuticals. So even though they are a modernized society, they are still using herbal medicine. Um, and they have literally um, thousands of species of plants available to them for various herbal treatments. Uh, and if you look at uh, a lot of Chinese apothecaries, um, or what we, would take, what we would call a pharmacy, is other than simply having a lot of drugs, they also have a, a, a huge assortment of dried plant tissue that they would use. In fact, even today, prescriptions filled in China, some are simply herbal medicine. Herbal herbs put together, matched together, and simply say, here's your prescription, take it home, make a tea, drink the tea. Uh, and so uh, it, even though they are a modern medis medical area, they're still using a lot of herbal medicine. All right, so let's switch a little bit to the biotechnology. So we, we talked about the herbal medicine. That's a little background on, on herbal medicine. It's still going on today. It's been going on for thousands of years. Um, so today in, in the biotechnology component of it, we're looking at the active components in plants. What, you know, what, is, what are the chemicals that are there that are actually doing this, this healing or doing these antibacterial, antiviral types of uh, activities? And these are referred to as what we call secondary plant products. Now, 
Uh, when you think of the biotechnology of this, you think of a plant that's going to be producing a compound that's going to help us feel better. Is this because the plant just really, really likes us and thinks, well, I want to help out these humans, so I'm going to generate this compound that will help cure cancer or help cure some ailment? And the answer to that question is obviously no. Plants, I don't know how much you like your house plants, but they really don't care much about you. Um, they're, not, they're not going to do anything to try to help you. Um, so why are the plants producing these? Well, most of these compounds that we find in plants are what we call secondary plant compounds. What does that mean? Uh, and some of you I know are probably not science majors, so we'll, we'll try to help you through this. Uh, if you look at plants, plants make a lot of compounds. Uh, you're probably familiar with processes like photosynthesis, cellular respiration, protein synthesis. These are all things that the plant has to do in order to live. You know, we have to do cellular respiration. We have to do protein synthesis. These are, and this is what we refer to as primary metabolism. These are, these are generating primary compounds, compounds that we absolutely need to live. So what are secondary plant products? Secondary plant products are ancillary to that, and they're not absolutely necessary compounds for the plant. Uh, I like to use the analogy in my plant physiology class that the secondary compounds versus primary, it's kind of like when you go out and you buy an automobile. If you're going to buy an automobile, what do you definitely need on that automobile? You're going to need an engine, you need some wheels, a steering wheel, and probably some brakes, right? But you also have other things on there. You have such things like windshield wipers. Right? Are those absolutely necessary? Well, this morning, yeah, they probably would have been. Right? But over the weekend, if you were driving around this past weekend, nice sunny days, you probably never used your windshield wipers, right? They were there, but you didn't need them. That's kind of like secondary plant products, these steroids and alkaloids and so forth. So why would the plant need these at certain times, but not at other times? Okay. Well, typically these are stress-induced compounds. Being students, you would know nothing about stress. Right? Um, but stress-induced compounds, usually through drought or herbivory. So as you see, the picture here on the left is, you know, here's a plant that's being decimated by some insects. So if you are outside one evening and the insects are bothering you, mosquitoes are buzzing around and biting you and other insects are landing on you, what do you do? Well, you can either swat the insect or you can finally say, I've had enough, I'm going back in the house. I'm going to get away from these insects. Plants don't have that option. Right? Plants can't say, and, you know, these, this, this plant can't start swatting those insects. It's not going to work. Right? And the plant can't get up and say, I'm going back in the house where it's safe. So the plants have evolved mechanisms to which they can help to try to ward off some of this herbivory and try to get rid of these, plant, uh, these, these, uh, these pests. And um, as you see in the little herbivore uh, apocalypse cartoon on the, uh, the right-hand side, is you see one plant actually saying to the other one, save yourself. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cute little joke, but actually it does happen in nature, where one plant can give off a compound into the soil that a neighboring plant roots will take up, and the neighboring plant says, there's something bad going on in the neighborhood, and it will begin producing these secondary compounds. So what do these secondary compounds do? These secondary compounds don't taste good to the insects. It's kind of like if I were to come in here and put down two bowls of greens, one's lettuce and the other are the grass clippings when I mowed my lawn. Which one are you going to make a salad from? Obviously the lettuce. Why not the grass clippings? They don't taste good. Why not? Because they have these secondary compounds in them. And if they don't taste good to you, they're not going to taste good to insects either. So how does all this work? All right, so I'm not going to bore you with all the, the nitty gritty details of how this works. But I want to point out how these compounds are produced, and then we'll talk about how we actually get them out of the plant. So stimulating, um, or stimulating the, the production of these secondary compounds uh, following an herbivore attack. So you see on the right-hand side is um, we have this um, we have this tomato plant over there, and if you look um, right there, there is a little caterpillar sitting there, and he's just chewing away on that leaf. Okay. So now that plant can't swat that caterpillar, and that plant can't get up and go back in the house. So what's that plant going to do? By that, anim by that insect eating that leaf, right, it's going to trigger a whole series of events. I won't go through all of these, but it's going to produce a compound called jasmonic acid. Jasmonic acid is a plant hormone. This hormone is going to be produced in the leaves that, in, that insect's chewing on. And as you notice, then that's going to be transported up through the vascular tissue of the plant to the other leaves. What that compound is going to do when it gets to the other leaves, it's going to activate a, a series of genes there. Those genes are going to code for producing some of these secondary compounds that don't taste good. So in other words, that leaf that that caterpillar is chewing on 
He is basically telling the rest of the plant, save yourself. Nothing I can do for me, but save yourself. So what's going to happen? Those other leaves are going to produce those secondary compounds. Very, very complex chemistry. Producing secondary compounds. When that caterpillar gets finished with that leaf, he's going to move on to those other leaves. He's going to start chewing on those, and he's going to say, this does not taste good. I don't like this. And so he's going to leave that plant and go to another plant. So it's a way that the plant can save itself. And usually that these uh, jasmonic acid is, is, is sent up the, the tree or up the plant because they're trying to preserve the younger tissues, the younger leaves. They're, that's the, the quote, future of the plant. Right? All right. So remember the, remember the name jasmonic acid. You're going to see that a little bit later on. All right. So what are some of the active compounds in plants? This is no, nowhere near an exhaustive list. But what is interesting is a lot of the compounds I have on this list, the name of the compound is actually named directly after the plant. And some of these compounds you actually may have taken at one time. Uh, we talked about digitalis, a cardiac glycoside found in foxglove, used for um, causing, um, you know, trying to stabilize heart, heartbeat, right? to get rid of arrhythmia. So why is the plant producing this? Is, is foxglove just really want to help us because it feels sorry for people who have arrhythmia? The answer is no. It will cause stabilization of the heartbeat in someone with arrhythmia. But what if you are a herbivore and your heartbeat is doing just fine. And you come along and you start chewing on foxglove. What's it going to do? It's going to cause arrhythmia. And so you're going to be chewing this plant and all of a sudden your heart's going to be doing this weird beat pattern. You're going to like, I don't feel so good. I'm not going to eat this plant anymore. Again, it's a deterrent, it's a secondary product, it's a deterrent to herbivory. Um, a few others you made before. I'm sure everyone here at one time or another has had aspirin. Right? Aspirin is derived from the willow, salix. In fact, uh, the main compound in aspirin, uh, salicin or salicylic acid, actually comes from the, the genus name of the willow, which is salix. That's where they get the name for that compound. Uh, so a number of others. Uh, Taxol, a very, very well-known treatment for uh, various types of cancer, um, comes from the Pacific U, which is the genus Taxus. So again, a lot of compounds are named directly from the plant that they, are, uh, that they come from. Um, not named for the plant, but um, anthroquinone. Many of, you, many of you may be familiar with the aloe vera plant. Sometimes it's called the burn plant. Uh, I actually know people who actually have an aloe vera plant growing in the kitchen window. And when they get a burn when they're cooking on the stove, they just take the leaf off, drop a few, put a few drops of the sap on, their, on the burn, rub it in there, and it soothes the pain right away. Uh, and so uh, it's referred to as the burn plant. Uh, and that's uh, anthroquinone, we know is what the compound that, that causes that. Uh, you can go out and buy a, uh, some anthroquinone or some, some topical stuff, but the plant works just as well. The, the, the sap is a little sticky, but it does, it does uh, do a good, nice job. All right. um, so how do we get drugs out of the earth? So, so we, know we, we know the plants are producing these drugs because they're not trying to help us. They're trying to help themselves, trying to ward off herbivory, trying to, to decrease the effects of a drought. But we find that these compounds do, in fact, help us in various disease prevention or disease treatment. A lot of these compounds, since, since other herbivores don't like these compounds, we've often found that, that bacteria and other small protozoans also don't like these compounds, and so it's a very good treatment for uh, various types of um, diseases. So I'm talking a little bit about what's called bioassay-driven uh, fractionation, and, and it's basically this. So if you think of traditional herbal medicine like Chinese medicine, so you get these herbs together and you, you say, okay, take this herb and this herb and we dry down the leaves and we grind them up, put them in a little bag, we make a tea out of it. So you drink the tea and the pain goes away. It does work. So then the question is, what's the compound that's doing that? Well, we know it's a water-soluble compound because how did you make the tea? You're not eating the leaves, you're making a tea. So you're putting these compounds into hot water, they get dissolved in the hot water, so we now know, okay, it's in the water. So then we do what's called bioassay-driven fractionation. And what you do is, so you take the raw material, you do the extraction, okay? Basically, you take the herb, put it in hot water, get the compounds out. Then, when you have the extract, is you check for biological evaluation. Does it really do what it says it's supposed to do? Is it antibacterial? So you just simply put it in the media, try to grow some bacteria on it, bacteria don't grow, you're like, okay, so it is going to get rid of bacteria. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that, that that extract now, and we're going to start to separate it into various components. And it's typically done a number of ways. One may be by solu uh, solubility of the compound. So we, have, we know it's in water. What if we take and add an organic solvent to that? 
Well, some compounds are going to stay dissolved, some compounds are going to precipitate and fall out. Okay, so now we've separated the compounds into what's soluble, what's not soluble. We're going to test both of those. Right? The precipitate, the, the solid stuff, doesn't have any biological activity, we're going to get rid of it. We're going to go on with the liquid part. Then we're going to add something else, maybe another reagent, maybe a different solvent. And now we find out, okay, now something else comes out of, out of solution, so we've got some things in solution, some things out of solution. What's the biological active part? Now it's the powder stuff, that, the, the, the solid material. So we get rid of the, the liquid part of it, we take that next part and we put it back into water, get it back in a soluble situation, and then we keep doing that. And you keep fractionating it into different types of compounds. And eventually, if you keep going and you get successful, you're going to get down to individual compounds. And that's what we mean by bioassay-driven fractionation. We just keep fractioning the thing, everything out and find out which fraction has biological activity. Um, I'm not going to go through all this, this, this gets into a lot more detail than, than we need for, for this presentation. But for example, um, here shows one um, a, a scenario that was one of my students used um, who, just, who just finished up her thesis this past spring, where you can see that the, the top she actually extracted 95% ethanol, some things got solubilized, some things were in the supernatant. The supernatant is the liquid part, the precipitate or the residue is the solid part. So she collected the residue, put it back into ultra pure water, um, and then found that some of the stuff went in, some of it didn't. The stuff that went into solution was what she wanted. That was the supernate. So she kept that, and then she treated it with another reaction or another chemical, and that was like, kind of like an oil and water where they separate. Some things went into the oil, some went into water. She found out which section was the, the biological active, um, and as it turned out, that was the, uh, the upper aqueous solution, which is the oily substance. Uh, added ethanol, and again, she just kept going through these procedures until she finally got down to what we refer to as a crude polysaccharide. She was looking for polysaccharides in, in the ginseng plant. Then what she did is separated those out, further fractioning by putting in, a, a, on an, I won't get into the detail, but an anion exchange column, it simply looks at the, how polar is the molecule, how much of a charge is on the molecule. Molecules that are highly charged will stay on that column and hold on tightly. Molecules that are weakly charged, you can get those to come off pretty quickly. So we put all the compounds on the, on the column, and then all she does is she added you know, pure water and then just increased the amount of sodium chloride, regular table salt. As you increase that, it pulls off the weaker, weaker compounds first. We save that fraction, put a little higher amount of salt, pulls off the next group of, of compounds, and she ended up with, with six different fractions that came off that column. And then she could test those to find out which of those polysaccharides, they all contain polysaccharides, which ones had the biological activity in it. And then, so that's just what we refer to as bioassay-driven bio fractionation, just to find out which fractions still have the activity in there. All right, let's skip. I had a little bit, let's talk a little bit about what we're doing here at MTSU. This is the part that, that Dr. Phillips said I can, I can talk about. In fact, he actually encouraged me to talk about this. Um, all right, so the Tennessee Center for Botanical Medicine Research. I'm going to refer to that as the TCBMR because I don't want to use all those syllables. Uh, so TCBMR, um, you may or may not be familiar with that. Um, that is here at MTSU. That is a center that, that, that we have here. Um, and again, I won't go through all the details here, but it was uh, basically established back in the June of, two, back in June of 2011. So it's been operational for about six years. Um, the primary goal is to develop drugs or nutraceuticals, if you're not familiar with that. These are nutritional supplements okay, um, from botanical sources. So where do we get all these botanical sources? Uh, this, the the, the CC, TCBMR is facilitated by collaboration with the, um, the Ganji Botanical Gardens over in China. Um, the, the Ganji Gardens in China, they have over 7,400 medicinal plants that they culture. And we're able to get compounds or, or get, get tissue culture from them, get, get plant uh, uh, extracts from them. Um, and these are all plants that are used in, in TCM, which is traditional Chinese medicine. So we have a, a great source of, of things to, to work with. Uh, a, a little bit about how it's interactive. Um, the TCBMR both in, in incorporates both biologists and chemists. So it's not a departmental thing. It is actually intra-departmental. Uh, biologists, what, what typically they do is that they screen for the biological activity. Okay, so are, the, are, are these compounds anti-carcinogenic? Are they anti-fungal, anti-bacterial, anti-viral? Is what do they do? Okay, uh, and then what the chemists do is that once we find uh, 
part of the extract or we've done some fractionation and we're down to a small fraction now, is the chemist will take and they'll work on purifying the active ingredients from the extract and look at either are there ways that we can synthesize this compound or ways that we can derivatize it. And if you're not familiar with what derivatizing means, is you could take a compound and you stick another little chemical group onto it. So you add something to it and you make it more potent. So maybe the, the, the compound as it's produced in the plant have a, has a certain amount of potency, but if we derivatize it, we may be able to make it even stronger. Okay, and so that's what the chemists are looking for. So it's a, it's a collaboration between both departments. I'd also add in here the agribusiness, agri-science uh, school is also involved in helping us to, to grow these plants and, and you know, keep them in culture for us as well. So drug discovery is a complex. I'm not going to minimize that and say it's simple. It's, it's, a, it's a complex process, but it follows a very straightforward procedure. Uh, and what you see here is you can see the different colored um, uh, items here. Uh, anything in orange are things that are uh, done through our collaborators, the, the Ganji uh, Botanical Gardens in China. They're the ones that they grow the botanicals, um, they isolate the extracts, they grow large amounts of it, um, although we are starting to do some of that here as well, through either through the biology department or through the agribusiness, agri-science. Um, what you see in blue, these are things that we're doing here in the biology department. So things like testing the extracts through what's referred to as a throughput microplate um, platform where you basically have a bunch of little wells in the plate and you put the different compounds in there along with, say, bacterial cells and you find out, okay, which, what, what fractions are bacterial side all, what fractions are not, which have biological activity, what doesn't. Uh, the items that are in, chemist, uh, in, in, in purple, these are what the chemistry department is doing, things like purifying the compounds, trying to identify what the compounds are. Uh, and then once you get those compounds, then over number six is again, you retest, make sure that, okay, you've isolated the compound, but does, does it still have biological activity or do we shoot the wrong direction? Yeah. Um, evaluate for purification um, and synthesis approaches. Can we synthesize it? If not, we're going to have to extract a lot of it from, from the plant material. Eventually, we get down to promising bioactivities in these compounds. And you notice step number 10 is in another color, green. And I don't have an um, identification for green because that means once you get to that point, you're doing human drug trials. Uh, MTSU, we do not have the license to do human drug, drug trials. But in this case, this would be, would be then turned over to a pharmaceutical company or some intermediate between us and the pharmaceutical companies, and they would take care of the drug trials at that point. All right, so we're going to go through all the details there. Um, so what has the, the TCBMR actually accomplished? And some of the, some of the numbers I'll give you are, are a little bit out of date. These are from last year's um, annual report. Um, the top three products that have been already identified uh, by the, the TCBMR, one's a, a patch for joint pain, a cream for sore muscles, and an ointment for gynecological issues. Uh, also, they've uh, the TCBMR has developed two additional pro uh, products that can be sold as nutritional supplements, both in the US and in China. One's a proprietary process, which simply means I can't tell you what that is, um, or I could, but we'd have to kill you, and we don't want to do that. Uh, to produce a ginseng liquid extract uh, that's, that would help stimulate the immune system, uh, something that would be used by someone, say, suffering from a simple cold or the flu, just to get your immune system going. Uh, or individual patients that are undergoing chemotherapy, because chemotherapy does inhibit the immune system, so this would help to stimulate their immune system during that treatment. Another is another proprietary process using a highly concentrated liquid from the extracts of the bud of hemp plants. Um, in, in the hemp plants are rich in cannabinoids, which um, are used as antidepressant and analgesic, analgesic properties. So these are some of the things we've accomplished. Uh, and I just put this slide up here because it shows you how extensive the research is in the TCBMR. Um, they have several patents. I think now it's up to in the area of around 15, 16 patents that, that are held by MTSU through the TCBMR. Uh, with the idea of eventually these patents would be sold or, or worked with, with a pharmaceutical company, uh, MTSU would get royalties from those, hopefully. Uh, numerous publications, I, I don't even know how the number is now, it's uh, several publications. External grants, the TCBM Bar has received external grants in excess of $2.6 million um, that's funding a lot of this research. Um, many of you know about Scholars Week presentations. Some of you may have actually have given scholar presentations. I think now this is somewhere, uh, somewhere between 50 to 60 presentations, posters at Scholars Week, and the majority of those are students as the principal author. So these are, a lot of these are student-driven uh, research. Presentations at national meetings, international meetings, national meetings. Um, one that you may be interested in, honors theses. Um, I think we've had somewhere near around 15 to 16 honors theses already that have gone through the TCBMR. Uh, uh, master's degree theses and PhD dissertations as well. I think we're up to about 
four or five of these already that have been generated, PhD students through the through TCMBI, TCBMR. Um, just so one, I want to highlight one study that was done. Uh, I don't know if you, you read the local newspaper, the Daily News Journal. Um, the first of this month, um, just literally 22 days ago, um, this was, was the, uh, in the, in fact, this was on the front page of the Daily News Journal. Um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Iris Gao, has, uh, the, she's the lead researcher on this project. And as you can see, I highlighted, since you can't read this part, I've highlighted some of the text. We're using the root of the star fruit tree. Um, I don't know if you ever had star fruits. Um, but star fruit tree is, um, using that root, um, they've been able to isolate a compound that has been very effective in, 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 in treating metastatic breast cancer. Uh, and the compound, as is identified there, is DMDD. If you want to know what that compound is, I've got a copy of the first page of the article where she published that. And the article is up there. It takes the first, uh, first two lines of that. Uh, so if you want to uh, uh, learn what that is, um, I can show you the publication um, later on. Uh, but this is some of the work that we're doing. Iris Gao has been very instrumental in doing a lot of this uh, research on this and a number of other projects as well. So where does, where does my lab fit into all this? You know, what, are, what, are, what are we doing? Uh, so what, what we do in our lab is I'm not involved in the compound side. I'm, as, as Dr. Phillips said, my, my degree is in plant sciences, so I'm, I'm a plant guy. Um, so my area is, okay, growing plants. So what we do is we try to take some of these plants that, are, that do have either medicinal uh, importance or some kind of other industrial value and that they are very difficult to propagate. For example, some plants that are really good medicinally are hybrid types of plants, which means the seeds are useless because the seeds are not genetically equal to the parent. So you can say, okay, get the seeds from the plant and plant it, but those, those, the next generation, they're not going to have the compounds you want. So you've got to somehow protect and, and save that germline. So, so what we do is we look at, at plants that are, easy, are difficult to propagate uh, or that you just can't use the seeds anyway. Right? And so I want to highlight, um, and I've invited some of my, my, my students here today uh, because I want to highlight what, what they're doing. Uh, and so over the past, I, I joined the TCBMR three years ago, back in 2014. Um, and um, I'm sure um, uh, Dean Vile and Dean Phillips will recognize some of these names. Um, we have a couple of uh, PhD students here, uh, but you notice most of the rest of these are all honor students working on their theses. Some have already uh, completed their theses. Um, and then uh, way, at, way at the end on the far right hand side, Marlene is uh, just a biology student. She's not an honor student, but she just wants research experience and she's working in our lab as well. So what are we doing? What are we working on? Well, we work primarily with four plants. We work with industrial hemp, cannabis sativa, because it does have a number of cannabinoids that are very important uh, pharmaceutically. We have also worked with American ginseng. Actually, we started out with American ginseng. We've, we've kind of mushroomed into these other, these other areas. Um, we've also working with grapes, which um, I wouldn't say are necessarily medicinal, but they are used in the wine industry. And if you think like I do, wine is medicinal. Um, so we worked with, uh, and Dr. Johnson put us on that, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then we've also had a student uh, this past year working with um, what's called King of Bitters, um, which as the name implies, it does have a bitter taste to it, but it does have a number of very important pharmaceutical compounds in there. And so I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing, is, and we'll highlight some of these student researches. So the American ginseng um, shows promise as a, uh, producing unique metabolites that can be used in anti-cancer, immune boosting properties. Um, Shannon and Matt have come up with protocols. We actually get this into tissue culture. And as Dr. Phillips said earlier, is what tissue culture is, is kind of like stem cells. If you think of stem cell research in humans, these are stem cells for plants. And now when I say stem, I don't mean the stem of the plant. I mean these are basic fundamental cells from the plant that can be used to generate more plants. Um, currently what they've done is they've actually got to the point where they can actually generate plantlets now from this callus. So this is what the callus looks like. It's not terribly attractive, but to us it is like gold. It's, and we look at that and we're like, oh, that is so cool. Uh, most people look at that and they'll say, yeah. Uh, but to us, it's, it's really cool. Um, but they're actually generating plantlets uh, and I think now it's like, what do we got? Like a couple thousand plantlets we've gotten out of this already. Um, and so what the current research is looking at, things like the ginsinicides. These are terpenes that have anti-cancer properties. I had a student working with the polysaccharides, evidence was working with those, uh, which have, again, a synergistic effect with the, the ginsinicides, looking at anti-cancer and immune be uh, boosting effects. Um, and, and I talked about that, that fractionation procedure, the polysaccharides. That was evidence's work that she did. Uh, and that was actually a picture right out of her thesis, um, and she just finished up this past spring. Uh, I hated to leave it. She's actually moved on to the master's program or the doctoral program in chemistry. Uh, I was trying to keep her in our lab, but she went away, so I'm trying to keep her there. 
Um, we're also looking at is, okay, so if we can produce these, these really important compounds, is can we get rid of the other stuff that we don't want? I mean, the com you know, all these secondary compounds, some are important pharmaceutically, some are not. So we want to get rid of the ones that are not. So we want to maybe look at maybe can we downregulate those, get rid of those things. Marlene's working on actually setting up a hydroponic system where once you get the little plantlets in the petri dish, is can we get those generated through um, um, hydroponic system and, and speed up the process of getting the, the compounds from these plants and generating more of the plants because these are very, very hard to propagate. Um, for, for someone growing a ginseng uh, area, uh, if a farmer wants to grow ginseng and start with seeds, it takes about seven or eight years before you get a mature enough plant that a pharmaceutical company will talk to you. So we're trying to cut that, that number down and trying to get these plants generating much faster. Um, so the wine grapes, uh, what, what are we doing with those? Um, uh, Dr. Tony Johnson, this is in collaboration with Dr. Tony Johnson over in uh, Agribusiness Agri-Science. Uh, and he, we basically, um, this is a, a wine grape that is, it's, it's the state grape of, the, of Missouri. Uh, and it's, it's, it's used in vineyards um, across the southeast. And it is a very, very disease tolerant, drought tolerant, pest resistant vine. It just grows and does its thing. You don't have to do anything with it. Um, but it does not like to get propagated. And you can't do it by seeds. It does produce seeds. But again, it's a hybrid, so the seeds are worthless. So you've got to propagate this some way, usually by cuttings in the wine and in the grape industry. But this does not do well by cuttings. So what we had, uh, I've had a couple students in my lab, uh, Amy Wilson you know, came up with a protocol to get this into tissue culture, which is actually difficult because there's a fungus that lives inside this plant, and fungus just tears up tissue cultures, not, not kind of complicates your work. Um, she was able to do that. We actually published her thesis back uh, last, in fact, a year ago um, this month. Uh, we published uh, her work. She's still working in the lab. She's working with uh, Hannah Hall, and Hannah's actually working with, well, uh, I've, I've tasked her with the idea of there's what the catalyst looks like, generate plants from it. So if we can generate plants, we actually already have a couple of uh, nursery vineyards. Uh, one of them's up in New York, and they said, if you can come up with that technology, we will buy it. So uh, we, we're, we're looking into that sort of thing. Um, I had Amanda uh, Yules, who has graduated and had moved on to a real job now. Uh, and she, is, she performed a year-long study to find out, okay, when's the best time to propagate this? And she did find out the best time to propagate this, um, but even then, her success rates were really, really low. I think she got to like 27% success in the best time of propagation, which vineyards are going to look at that and they're going to say, no, we're not doing that. And it's just 27% is not enough. Um, this research is in collaboration, as I mentioned, with Dr. Tony Johnson, ABAS, uh, and the new fermentation science degree program. And uh, right now, we're, in fact, we're just waiting. We haven't got the signed contract yet, but we are getting a funding through the USDA and the Tennessee Department of Agriculture to, to do this, this, work, this research. Working with industrial hemp, uh, which contains a number of very promising compounds referred to as cannabinoids, uh, which have a lot of potential pharmaceutically. Um, Shannon Matt. Uh, a couple undergraduates, Kayla and Zoe, are working to get the lines into tissue culture, uh, mainly because our ultimate goal is if we breed lines of hemp and we get, like, you know, if you have like 10 lines of hemp and each have a, an, a, 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 an important cannabinoid, and you want to get those all into one plant. So you breed, randomly breed these things until you get a plant and you say, you finally have one plant out of, say, a thousand. You test it and you say, wow, it's got eight of the ten cannabinoids we really, really want. Okay. Can we use the seeds? No, because it's a hybrid plant. Seeds are worthless. So we've got to protect that germline. We've got one plant. It has a lifespan. We've got to protect that germline. We have to get into tissue culture. And so what Kayla and Zoe are looking at is what's the best tissue culture media to use because we find that all the different hemp varieties, they respond differently to the media. Some are good, some are bad. We're trying to find out what the best media is. Um, Rachel is in, uh, just started in the lab, and she's looking at uh, investigating a way that we can actually fool the plant. I love teasing students, and I love teasing plants. We're, what we're trying to do is, remember I mentioned about that jasmonic acid, that hormone that, that tells the plant, you're under attack, you need to produce these compounds. Okay, I don't want the plant to be stressed and have insects chewing on the plant. So what we want to do is, can we grow that plant hydroponically in a water system? and then just add that hormone to it, methyl jasminate to it. Theoretically, the plant should say, I'm under attack. I need to produce this compound. Yet the plant's living in a luxury environment. Is it going to work? We, we have evidence that will work when you spray it on the leaves, but if you're doing this on a large scale, who's going to, you know, you got to be out in the field spraying this on leaves. We could do this in a controlled environment. We just put it in the solution here, let the roots take it up. 
And that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to investigate, to see can we fool this plant to thinking it's under attack. And that's what, uh, that, that's what Rachel is working on. And one of you two gentlemen are going to get to see her proposal probably next semester. She's, she's in the process of putting that together right now. Um, King of Bitters, uh, Cassandra Mahalko uh, just graduated, or not graduated, just finished her thesis and, and defended this past summer. Um, she was looking at saying, okay, so if we get this in a tissue culture, because this plant's really hard to generate from the seeds, if we get this in the tissue culture, can we get these important compounds out of those stem cells, out of that callus? Uh, what she found was, no, you can't. Because those cells are growing in a luxury environment. We've got it in a nice petri dish. We're giving it everything it wants, then all the nutrients, the humidity, the temperature. And the plant's like, why not to produce those? Nothing's bothering me. But she did hypothesize that we might be able to add an elicitor to get to produce those compounds. What would be the elicitor? Methyl jasminate. Can we give those stem cells that hormone and say, okay, you're under stress, produce the compounds. Um, so we're actually looking for, uh, you know, we're looking for someone to carry on that research. Um, I tried to, tried to postpone her thesis and she didn't go for it. So, um, but so we're looking for someone to take and, and pick that project up and, and run with that as well. Um, so bottom line is, what are we trying to do? In plant biotech, this is the biotech part of it. So, Traditional herbal medicine has been going on for thousands of years. We know there's a scientific basis. We know the compounds are there. So can we find ways to get the compounds out? Yeah, the chemists and other biologists are doing that in the TCBMR. What our lab's looking at is can we find ways to do this more productively under controlled environments? We don't have to grow a whole field of this. We can do it in a Petri dish inside an incubator. And get, and get these cells to produce these compounds. So we're looking at that industry. We can, they can use those to metabolize in a shorter amount of time, and it's all in a controlled environment. We don't have to worry about growing these plants. We don't, we're not dependent upon what the weather is. Also from industry is, can we generate a lot of plant embryos from a particular germline? So we get that germline into stem cell culture. Can we get a lot of embryos out of there? And then we can get a huge number of plants. And you can see some of the plates there. Um, that's the um, American ginseng, uh, all the embryos that they have, have generated in the lab. Um, uh, and so can we get these things and, and produce a lot of plants very, very quickly? All right, um, no talk is, is complete unless you give an acknowledgments. And so I, I do want to give acknowledgments. Um, first off, Dr. Elliot Altman, um, who's not with us, he's still back in his office working. Uh, he's the director of the TCBMR, and I want to thank him because three years ago, uh, he came to me and said, would you join the TCBMR and run the tissue culture lab? And I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And uh, it, it was, it was, it was it's been a very rewarding um, um, experience. Dr. Iris Gow, I mentioned, she's one of the lead researchers in TCBMR and she directs a number of students in, in their projects as well. Tony, Tony Johnston um, in the fermentation science program, um, he's the one that got us started on the grapes and that has just gone, gone crazy. We've we got a lot of stuff going on. Um, the rest of these names, everyone else up here does not have a doctor in front of their names. These are all uh, either graduate students or uh, undergraduates and some of them are here. And I'm not going to make you guys stand, but just raise your hand if your name's on this list. So they're all sitting right there, uh, and uh, I just want to, I want to acknowledge them because they are the people that are doing the work in the lab. They're in the lab day by day, and, and I've, I've told them this before, but they're the ones that are working so hard, they're making me look good. <laughs> My department chair says, oh, you're, you're doing this wonderful stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's go with that. I'm doing the wonderful stuff. And I go back to the lab and say, keep doing the wonderful stuff. <laughs> and, and they're the ones that are doing it. Um, I do also want to acknowledge that we, are, we do have funding through the um, biology department. The TCBMR gives us some funding. Uh, Greenway Herbal Products is one that is helping to fund a lot of our hemp research. Um, and then a number of my students have, undergraduates have gotten um, the Undergraduate Research Council Eureka Awards uh, and helped to fund some of this work. And then we have that uh, USDA uh, Department of, uh, Tennessee Department of Agriculture grant as well. So uh, I know at the end of the talk is you always applaud the, in, the, uh, the presenter, but what I want you to do is I want you to think about these people that are working for me as well. So when you give your applause, it's not just for me, but it's for these folks as well. So thank you very much. We do have a few minutes, so if anyone has any questions, any questions for if you, if you have questions, I will be glad to direct you to my students, and they will be glad to answer those for you. Yes? Uh, would y'all manage to get the uh, go-ahead to go ahead and work with the uh, hemp plants? I'll say it again. I'll show you the go-ahead to go ahead and work with the uh, hemp plants. Uh, here. Um, uh, interesting. Um, the uh, Greenway Herbal Products is a company founded here in Murfreesboro uh, where they basically they want to be the intermediate between us, the university, and the pharmaceutical companies. And in order to do that research, is they actually had to get the legislature of, of Tennessee 
to pass a law that says you can do hemp research, but it has to be in conjunction with a four-year comprehensive university. And as it turns out right now, MTSU is the only four-year comprehensive university in the state of Tennessee doing this research. And they are, they're our company that, that's working with us, and I also want to mention them because they are a very nice benefactor for, for our research. But yeah, we, we had to get special permission, so we had to work with state legislators to get that, that law passed so they could do that. And it, it took a little while, but they, they twisted enough arms up in Nashville and got it taken care of. So it, it's, and, and by, by the way, uh, it, it's not marijuana. It is cannabis sativa, but it has very low THC, so you could smoke this stuff all day long and you're not going to get a buzz, so yeah. But, but that's also written in the law. Uh, if, if we start doing breeding studies, um, our, our license says we can go up to 0.6%, I think it is, THC. If we find a plant that has higher than that, we have to destroy the plant immediately. To which I said, we will, we'll burn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, other questions? Anybody else? This might be a little bit more on the side of chemistry, but um, as far as uh, when you guys fractionate uh, the compounds trying to isolate it, have you guys found uh, in any of the assays that Sometimes there's an interaction between two compounds that may or may not be in different fractions. Sure. In fact, um, we, we know this, that, that that will happen as well because, for example, in traditional Chinese medicine, is they will actually mix herbs together and try to get that interaction between, between compounds of, of this herb and this herb and put them together. And so some of the work they look at, uh, right now they're looking at individual compounds, but then also looking at the interaction of compounds as well. But it, that's mostly the chemical side. Um, and some of the people that are doing the actual um, bioassay-driven part of it, uh, which is not really what we're working on, but I've, I've, ta I've spoken with them, and yeah, they are looking at some of the interaction compounds. Yeah. And, and, and that's, if, for example, some of the stuff we do with, the, with the, um, the ginseng is they produce compounds called ginsenicides, and there's also polysaccharides. We find that the polysaccharides have some enhancement of the ginsenicides. So yeah, there are, there's a lot of interaction that goes on. And we're just starting to understand that, we being the discipline, just starting to understand some of that interaction. Thank you. All right, thank you.